problem is, yeah, you know what, physics, chemistry, those two guys have like centuries head start in front of biology. And so yes, biology is mostly memorization. There's a lot of reasons as to why this is, but at the end of the day, that is the way that it is. You have to work with that. And so while it is mostly memorization, there's a lot of things that you can do that can help kind of minimize the amount of memorization that you have to do in order to understand everything. Because like, let's say that you get into whatever it is that your end goal is as a biology student, either graduate school or medical school, pharmacy school, nursing school, whatever your goals are, you end up being hit with this overwhelming amount of information during your first couple of years doing that stuff. But what you can do that will really help you and will make you a better student in anything that you're working on is development and establishment of conceptual frameworks. The underlying details aren't what matters. What matters is a conceptual framework that helps you put everything together and almost predict, to some extent, what is going to happen uh, and what you're gonna be learning about. So for this video, I wanted to make the 10 most common and most helpful conceptual frameworks that I've discovered that have totally minimized the uh, amount of memorization that you have to do as a student majoring in biology. So the first thing that I wanted to mention would be understanding the science of complexity itself. Life is incredibly complex and incredibly difficult to understand. We're still at the descriptive phase of biology and that we can describe a biological system, uh, you know, as you know, this is the, the, this is the mitochondria, this is the DNA, all of that stuff. But once we get to the explanatory phase, the explanation side of things, you're gonna to have to understand what it is to be a complex adaptive system. And so developing that framework early on is gonna help you out so much, right? Um, it, it's, it's one of the most universal and scale invariant things that I've ever seen. A sigmoidal curve can be observed on enzyme kinetics because enzymes are adaptive systems. Population growth curves, adaptive systems. Uh, pediatric growth charts of an individual. That's an adaptive system. So anytime some type of an adaptive system is performing any sort of a function, you end up seeing a sigmoidal curve. And that to me is so incredible because it's, it's not this like linear thing. It's something that is totally dynamic and, and taking in a bunch of information at once, processing it in a certain way, and then the output is responsive to the actual input values um, at, at a given time. I know that's very abstract, but if you can understand that, either through taking a course on complexity or maybe reading books by, uh, I think Jeffrey West wrote a book called Scale, it's a huge recommendation. I think if you can understand that, you would be well on your way to understanding the most complex thing in the world, which is life. So again, the beauty of this, whether we're talking about enzyme kinetics and biochemistry, populations in ecology, or uh, the growth of an individual in let's say a developmental biology class, all of those things can be united under the same framework of understanding life in the form of a complex adaptive system. Moving on from that, an equally important idea is what was originally coined by John Wheeler, the physicist, called it from bit philosophy. It from bit philosophy is basically just says, instead of thinking about things like charge or velocity or a hormonal axis or something like that, you can think of it as a much more abstract concept of information. There's information in the gene products of the hedgehog gene. There's information in the morphogen gradient in developmental biology. Uh, spiral cleavage breaks the symmetry versus radial cleavage, which does not. And symmetry breaking conveys information. The linear order of Hox genes is conserved specifically because the linear order, that arrangement, the structural arrangement of Hox genes conveys information. And so for me, I think Rather than thinking about things as, as unique and individualistic systems, understanding everything in terms of its connectivity and just literally as a series of data inputs and outputs really gave, you, gave me a strong framework and it will hopefully help you guys eventually as you're studying your career in biology. Number three uh, is endosymbiotic theory. So uh, obviously natural selection evolution is not gonna be on this list and just how nothing in biology makes sense outside of evolution Nothing in the molecular biology makes sense outside of evolution. And I think if you understand the development of a lot of the structures that you have, the Golgi bodies, the mitochondria, all of that stuff, that's gonna help you understand why the system is the way that it is. And endosymbiotic theory was one of the most incredible ideas in that it gives you that framework. Number four is R versus K selection theory. Yes, biology is complex, life 
is complex. And the only way you can understand complexity is through R and K selection theory. It's not just about the reproduction rates of an organism or you know the size of that organism. It plays down to complexity itself. Understanding the differences in the complexity of a eukaryotic gene expression versus that of prokaryotic gene expression. This is one of those things that is scale invariant and universal. Doesn't matter whether we're talking about the central dogma of molecular biology or the reproductive rates of ants versus that of an elephant. R versus K selection theory gives you that framework that enables you to understand. Five, and something I could probably talk about in its own video is the second law of thermodynamics. It, the way that you will understand how good a scientific idea is, is if you can put it into the context of the second law of thermodynamics and push it to its limit, okay? And a lot of people really, I think, have this closed-minded approach to understanding the second law of thermodynamics. It's not just about gases <laughs> and the entropy uh, of that specific open or closed system. It is the most universal application out there. It explains why I'm aging. I don't look the same as I did whenever I was 12, despite the fact that my DNA is being fairly accurately replicated every time a cell of mine divides. It explains why I uh, stop growing at a certain point, even though I keep eating. That's kind of odd, isn't it? It explains why time moves in one direction, and it also explains why you can never get a 100% yield in chemistry, and a bunch of other things that I'm not even aware of, like black holes, entropy of black holes, and how that points to a holographic universe. If you can take the idea of the second law of thermodynamics with you whenever you go into any class in biology, I guarantee you, you will have a better understanding of how things work. The role of surface area, volume, dimensional analysis type stuff. So, if you have a square, it's two-dimensional, right? It's an X and Y. If you have a cube, it's three-dimensional. It's an X, Y, and Z. And if you had something that had another axis between it, it would be fourth-dimensional. And you may not actually think that that matters much for biology, but it actually matters a whole lot, especially when you look at the evolution of the brain. Your brain is so good at what, doing its job. Despite the fact that Homo sapiens had smaller brains than Neanderthals, we have maximized our surface area to volume ratio so that we can do the same job, cognitive processing, within by taking up less space. And this may seem like a singular, you know, just limited to the brain. It's not. You'll see infoldings in the endomembrane system at the level of cells. You will see uh, certain developmental processes relying on this. And what's even better about it is if you look at things like Kleiber's law, we can actually uh, scale our circulatory system to a fourth dimension, which is, you know, it's a three plus one because of the fractal dimension. And so I think if you understand the relationships between the dimensions that these processes are working in, the dimensions at which the exchange of information is happening, that'll help you understand many, many, many different aspects of not only developmental biology, but ecology as well, and almost every discipline that you're gonna come in or encounter. And I also think it's really important that you understand fractals and then fractal dimensions associated with it. You don't really need to be a super duper mathematician in order to be successful in biology. I think trig is the highest math class I had to take, at least as an undergrad major. And the thing that I think is important though that you know about fractals is that fractals enable us to understand the networks and connectivity of a complex adaptive system, uh, a living organism, on a much more quantitative and intuitive level. Your, your cardiovascular system, microtubule networks, uh, mitochondrial networks, you know, neurons, all that stuff can be modeled with fractals. We should have mentioned this at the beginning, the concept of equilibrium. Believe it or not, that's actually a really, really, really difficult thing for me to understand. As a student in biology, you are initially taught that everything is this all or nothing phenomenon. The uh, RNA polymerase binds at the site or doesn't bind at the site. But in reality, every biological reaction is to some extent existing in equilibrium. It's just a how much. And that's a very difficult thing for me to understand. The concept of the selfish gene, originally coined by Richard Dawkins. To be honest with you, I think this is an idea that people have taken a bit too far, but that's just because it's so good at explaining a lot of the things that we, we see. For example, if you look at molecular biology, you'll learn about transposable elements or other features like that, which seems really counterintuitive, right? Why would, why would we waste precious ATP cutting out a piece of our DNA, risking it being exposed to God knows what, only to cut it out in another place and insert it later on in someplace else? And while indeed, 
transcription and uh, control and other regulatory processes can evolve from that, that simple concept can be explained solely in the framework of genes are being selfish, and that alone, I think, plays a, a huge role, not just in molecular biology, obviously, but in many other aspects of biology as well. And the last on this list, probably should have mentioned this first, is evolution by natural selection. Um, a lot of my physics friends have a really hard time believing that I actually think Charles Darwin was smarter than, than Einstein, in a sense that uh, evolution has done more for biology than general relativity has for physics. It doesn't really matter whether you are studying uh, ecology, microbiology, botany, molecular biology, biochemistry, genetics, whatever it is you're studying, immunology, all of those things can be connected into the single theoretical framework of evolution. And it's so powerful. I, I am just, if, if you're attending a university that isn't teaching that or isn't really emphasizing that heavily, you're probably not getting a good education in the biological sciences. Not exactly a concept. I think one of the things that I also really would like to mention is knowing the difference between a description and an explanation will certainly help you, especially in the medical field, I found. Uh, a lot of people, whenever you ask them how drugs work, their answer will usually be a description versus, say, that of an explanation. So let me give you an example. If I were to ask you how uh, ibuprofen works, you would say, well, ibuprofen reduces inflammation but you haven't actually explained what's happening. You're describing what the ibuprofen is doing. You're not explaining what the ibuprofen is doing. And the difference between the two is that one of these is uh, uh, just a description of events happening and the other one is a mechanistic framework. So for example, if I were to say, how does ibuprofen work? I'd say, well, it reduces reactive oxygen species, which act as second messengers for signaling cascades that promote inflammation. That's an explanation because it's a cause and effect relationship uh, that's established. To give another example, my favorite example that I usually give of this would be uh, in physics, right? Uh, Isaac Newton described gravity really, really well through classical mechanics, but he never explained what it was. He left that for the consideration of the reader. And it wasn't until Einstein came along and developed this idea that, oh, it's, it's, it works not by, you know, this magical event, but by actually curvature of space-time. That was the explanation to Isaac Newton's description. And, and I think understanding those two different things will really help you out a lot.